So one thing here, as we all sit uh, waiting for this, uh, this lecture to commence, is that we are living in a historic moment. We are living in between two systems. We have a, a major fight over an under, underdefined system um, that will either look like a very beautiful world that actualizes a lot of innate potentials that humanity has had for a very long time, but has been kept from um, acting upon due to the fact that we have lived under systems of empire for a very, very long time that have unnaturally kept us thinking as a species that we are something that we are not, that we are consumers, but that we're not creators, uh, that we are meant to divide our minds and compartmentalize our minds into realms of very, very minute specialization and that a scientist really shouldn't properly think of themselves as an artist or a musician shouldn't think of themselves as a historian or an economist as a political scientist. These are all different things. Now, um, beyond all of the different elements of why we're in this crisis, I think it's important to take a step back and realize that the, the unifying theme, uh, whether you're looking at the economic aspect, the war drive aspect, the systemic breakdown, how people are approaching the uh, pandemic, all of these things, <clears throat> the, the, the unifying theme, why these issues are not being resolved properly and being seen through coherently is because there's a problem in the way of thinking per se, um, which is why we at the Rising Tide Foundation, Cynthia, myself, uh, all of our friends um, who have taken part in this organization and this project, the reason why we're doing these lectures, why we, we do the essays, why we do the outreach is because we're trying to deal with this issue of how people are thinking and how a real uh, human mind is able to think and create uh, pro solutions to problems that um, no other animal in the, in the biosphere can do. One of the best ways of doing this is by realizing that the greatest artists in history who gave us greater uh, degrees of understanding greater modes of communicating impassioned ideas respecting man and nature were themselves committed to a higher universal process that was exemplified wonderfully by none other than Frederick Schiller. Nicholas Jones, who himself is a student of, of physical economy of a, of a very, very rigorous sort, um, as well as an artist, a professional dancer, and an impassioned uh, president of the Artists' Alliance for Africa, who's given several other presentations to us in the past, um, has taken on the challenge of examining one aspect of, of Schiller's mind, his work, his method of thinking, which he'd like to share with us today in the form of, uh, of today's lecture. So, uh, Nick, I will uh, not say any more and just leave it to you to take it away. Great. Thanks, Matt. So, just to begin, um, yeah, today I'm going to be, like I said before, going through a lot of uh, ideas and about how these ideals work on us and how the artist is intending for them to work on us. I'm going to give it a good old stab in two hours. Uh, like I said before, the, the content is so rich that uh, we could split this play into three parts. We could do, take it act by act and spend a, you know, a couple of hours on each act and really go through the the deeper meanings and, and how these ideas act on the very people and how they act on us as an audience of those people and the historical events that are taking place. So first I'm, here I'm gonna talk about Schiller. We're gonna open with a little part on Schiller. Schiller is, is born in 1759, a time of immense opportunity as the time was one of political upheaval and conditions had reached a a kind of limit as to what the citizens could suffer any longer. The, the standards of living on the European continent were uh, in a, you know, largely unsatisfying for the general populace. And uh, off of the back of the Golden Renaissance, with the elevation of culture and education, people's standards also were elevated and they were calling for uh, greater universal access to these rights and standards of living physically and also uh, in our minds as well. So he, alongside Goethe and others, gave birth to what has become known as uh, Weimar classicism. And uh, bear in mind that 
though he birthed five more classes and when he was born the enlightenment period was was in its heyday and and largely it um was peaking around this time so he would have been well read on such works from john locke rousseau uh, descartes duma a lot of romanticism um at the same time as he would have also been well educated on what beethoven was doing uh, was working alongside goethe and other previous german classicists who were working in a in in the same light as what he was going to do later but he's born into a time of uh, where romanticism is is quite popular and uh and we can imagine given you know that we've been able to to read and and uh enjoy his work that he's he's not a romantic even though many times you know non-diligent historians will kind of put him in that box and they'll also do that with goethe like it's really inaccurate it's not true and uh, anybody who's actually read and studied his work will see that like it's like you know lightened up um i would also imagine that given the events surrounding the french revolution he would have been quite disappointed with their ideas and in hindsight uh, would have and did go on to say that the culture was largely responsible for the failure of that people in their quest for a republic. It wasn't necessarily simply a political failure or mechanical failure. It really was a failure of ideals and culture and art. The art and the culture hadn't risen to the place that was needed to elevate people's senses to a place where it wouldn't just fall into, because of course, as we've already stated, right, like the conditions on the on the continent were not so good. So sensually, that places a, a form of oppression on us, which is quite physical. And in counter to what happened in America, per se, when you arrive in a new world, which is largely unextorted and, and an open land, Europeans coming from oppression across the sea, it would have been easy centrally to see the opportunity that literally lay before your eyes. I mean, if we all put ourselves on those ships landing on the shores and you see this new world, which is largely, okay, we're not empty. There's a culture there that already pre-exists, but not one that has gone on to, to reach the heights of maybe Europe in terms of population density and uh, other like um, parameters as well. So, it would have been easier for those people to centrally elevate themselves to a place of creative reason where they would have been like, okay, we need to do this, we need to have laws, we need to have order, we need to have infrastructure, we need to, that's quite easy. But if you're in France, say, surrounded by poverty, disease, and uh, all of these central things that are really pulling you down, pulling your senses down to the floor, like... Sorry, uh, Nick? Uh, there's yeah. somebody, I think, yeah, uh, doing sorry. dishes in the background or something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, so they would have been, it, it would have been obvious, if we put ourselves in their shoes, it would have been harder for them to just naturally have that elevation that most people have when they see an uh, empty space of land. So that's quite simple. And so he's really, you know, in his letters upon the ascetic education of man, uh, he he does specifically say that the time found a wanting people. And uh, this is a really large metaphor. But if one reads those letters, they will find that he is insinuating that it, it was the culture that failed the people. And therefore, the method by which they tried to bring about a true and noble revolution, in fact, became a revolution of chaos, anarchy and misery. So if the culture is one of ugliness and decay, then the means will bring about quite an unfortunate end that is found wanting more of the time than what it produced. So my question at the beginning of this lesson is, whose duty is it to uphold the culture of a nation? We'll get to this like in the play, but this is kind of my underlying question. Like, Whose duty is it to uphold the culture of our nation? Having witnessed towards the end of his life the beginning of the Napoleonic Wars, he knew well of the threat of tyranny and empire and therefore spent a large part of his life trying to defeat it through culture and art rather than through force. He, he was trying to, uh, if you could say, 
inset people's minds in a way which is like harmonious with what they already were rather than dictate to them and tell them like this is the way you need to be which we all know in practice very rarely works so this is another example of the artist being able to work on his audience in a way which is non-violent there is a certain element of con conflict and there is a contradiction in that but again we're going to get that to that later when we talk and open up the play and we'll see how those contradictions are right there in the text. William Tell, which is the play we're gonna focus on today, is a masterpiece for all time for the very reason that it gives a very detailed and literal, but beautiful method on how to defeat tyranny and empire with Republican ideals, okay? He embodies his own idea of becoming a world citizen in action is he makes a conscious effort to focus on historical narratives that pay attention to the role of the independent citizen thinking about their own needs for the needs of the greater population. We've seen this in other texts as well, uh, like Nicholas of Fusa is already talking about this, you know, just before the Golden Renaissance, um, the greater good, like committing actions for the other, that by taking care of ourselves, we're actually taking care of others as well, and so on and so forth. So this truly sets Schiller, Friedrich Schiller apart as the poet of freedom, because he, instead of like, um, like Dumas or Descartes, like whenever we read their art, we often are left with a, a strong feeling of disappointment or, or um, Okay, so for example, we do a ballet called uh, Lady of the Camellias, which is a Dumas novel, and uh, it's a very unhappy ending. Now, most of romanticism, uh, romanticism's novelists or, or artists were purely rooted in the failures of uh, humanity's sensuality. Like, they, they only ever focus on how we mess up, and that's it. End of story no uh, potential to learn from the mistake, no potential to rearrange our thoughts and ideals to a higher place so that we don't commit the same mistake again. Uh, no, none of that, just simply like, oh, you're at the will of nature, good luck to you. So, like, um, Schiller's not doing this at all. Schiller will give you a tragedy, yeah, like, and he doesn't, it's not all skipping in the meadow, no, but it's that at the end of the tragedy, there will be this underlying principle that will lift your feeling of sorrow or suffering to a place of, yes, I suffer, but I can correct the mistake in future or even now, like I can change that in me and I have free will to do that. So my ideals will manifest my actions. So that's a simplified idea of what Schiller's work was directed towards. And, and now I want to, because, like, yeah, like I say, I've got to keep an eye on the time. And uh, I want to now dive into a specific work of his, the William Tell, to seek more answers into this idea of becoming a world citizen and putting the needs of the general citizenry above your own. Because I know a lot of people, when they think of this idea, it, it almost comes with this idea of like self-sacrifice and it really doesn't have to be like that. And we're gonna see this in the characters in the play. Uh, there is an element of that, but like I say, there's a contradiction in it. It does benefit yourself as well. It's not just, oh, I'm gonna be a martyr. I mean, of course, and like depending on the level of evil, sometimes it, it unfortunately ends in a finality, but if you take Joan of Arc, or which is at that case in point, uh, which is another play of Schiller's, a tragedy. Well, first of all, in that play, he beautifies her ending uh, so that her historical relevance is greater. And so that the audience is not left with this feeling purely of sorrow that, you know, that it was a failure, but martyrs her, so to speak, and um, really sets her as this historical person. and. Actually, Schiller is largely, probably largely responsible for the reason that Joan of Arc is a patron saint of France today. Um, his play did a lot for upholding her character historically, and he does this with characters 
across the board. He is lifting them and kind of like placing them in heaven. Like these are our idols. These are the people we should be reaching for. If we act on the same principles as this lot, we'll probably do quite well. So, William Tell, I'll give you a, uh, a bit of background. We'll rush through this. William Tell was written in 1805, uh, really at the end of Schiller's life. This was not the first attempt to dramatize this historical event, and he had others to draw from, uh, such as a hand scriber. Uh, adaptation that was done in 1474. It's actually called the White Book of Simon, and today we cannot find it. Uh, it's it's this book, this White Book of Simon, this original uh, first printed edition of like the Tale of Tell, because it's mostly in origin. Um, you can imagine that if if people are fighting an empire, that empire probably wouldn't have wanted that books be written about a, a, a you know. A bunch of forest people, you know, sticking it to a, the great Habsburg dynasty, you know. So there's obviously those reasonable ideas that we have, and of course I can't certify that. You know, I can't go back 700 years and certify that, but we can understand. We can put ourselves in those shoes, like any human would, and understand the the severe consequences of the time. And um, even a 1474 adaptation of this tale has somehow cease to exist in, in in libraries around the world now apparently there is a version and it's in latin but i don't you know i don't speak latin it will be something to get around to the root the oath appears in this version first but again today like i said it's almost impossible to find so even the original root the oath it's it's you know, we, we don't actually know what it is hence why it's so important uh, what schiller did right he uh, realizes that there's a part of history which can could be forgotten. And being a world citizen, both in the past and the future, he is acting for the future and saying, this is too important to be lost. So I must re-establish it in people's minds as an ideal and as a piece of art that will help them defeat empire and tyranny and oppression in the future. So his adaptation is a rich and accurate description of events, largely due to the fact that he was an historian himself. And he, he a few years before he had written his universal history paper, which uh, again, if we look at that, it will give us further insight into how he goes about, um, you know, writing these plays. But um, he started collecting historical sources related to Tell all the way back in 1779. And after Goethe had visited the Lake of Lucerne and brought back a copy of Agistus Schudi's Chronicum Helveticum, from which Schiller drew much of his context. So the Chronicum Helveticum is the original uh, statement of the Confederacy of Switzerland. Like it's the original text that was created as a form of like declaration of independence sort of for the confederacy of switzerland and its independence thereafter and still to this day that document is of like you know vital importance and we're going to go into later how as a in the modern world how switzerland has managed to remain independent and still exhibits that Republican ideal in the certain actions that they take. I see Hugh shaking his head, and I know, Hugh, that Switzerland has a really tarnished past as a nation, as any good nation does, with the Nazis and with the banking system, taking gold out of Jews' teeth and all sorts of things. But we must not forget the good, because the good is actually more powerful than the bad. So, with this text, we, we set forth these principles and, uh, you know, back and forth, as, as many nations find, including America, like uh, two steps forward, one step back. But it's it's been vital in his, uh, Switzerland's development as a nation. And we can argue and debate about that later as to how it's developed them up until today. But just to stay, stay on Schiller, that, that shows his... Uh, 
accuracy. That's a full two decades of research before he actually writes the play. And, and the play is uh, uh, in this book, 117 pages. So 20 years of study. And he wouldn't have just been working on that, of course, he would have been working on other things. But that's like, that's amazing, right? Like, you know, the, the level of diligence that he puts into the, these plays. And the dem that's why you see like the density of the text and the word that's being spoken. It's just so accurate, even if it's not word for word, which of course, like he has poetic license to do that and, and to, to build whatever psychological thoughts in his audience that he needs to get people to act, right? I mean, why do we learn history? To what end do we learn history? What's the point at the end of the day? What's the point of culture? If it's not to elevate people to greater action, then, then what are we doing? Where are we going? And all of that stuff starts to become whimsical if we don't have these principles set in place. It all starts to become sensual and like, oh, well, I'm just going wherever I feel like. But that never did any good for anyone. So the historical background of this story is a, a kind of David versus Goliath, which, again, Schiller loves these ironies, because you know, the greatest extremes. It leaves him the greatest amount of space in the middle to, to paint all the pictures that he wants to paint. The former being Switzerland and the Habsburg Wall of the Austrian Empire, the latter. This episode takes place in 1291. Um, I double checked that. The date is a little bit like 1291, 1294. And uh, the current emperor of the Habsburg dynasty of the Austrian Empire is on his deathbed and uh, he's not really running things anymore. He's a tyrant straight up, but like everybody else around him, like there's a period of chaos where people are starting to be able to do kind of what they want because the, the emperor's in bad health. So even if you have a dictator, like we've seen this in Iraq and Libya and places, right? Like better that you have some form of stability with a dictator, even if it may be, than a vacuum of political power where terrorism can evolve and so on and so forth. So even in this time, you, you have a similar kind of, thing taking place where you you'd see these royal families change uh, you know lineage like would, would shift down and in the changes we have it in Britain too there's a period of chaos and there's a battle going an internal battle politically going on between different forces and so things get interesting to say the least and uh, for good or for bad like uh, the ground begins to shake beneath us so this small people in Switzerland from just three cantons at the time and later has grown into 26. But Uri, Schweiz and Unterwalden go on to deny the Austrian Empire dictatorship over Switzerland and form the Helvetic uh, Confederation. This is where the Rudli Oath becomes of importance. It is the first declaration of independence for Switzerland that has many of the same universal characteristics as the declaration in the USA. Uh, when a people found wanting of a virtuous leader must rise above and lead themselves to glory and freedom. This is the case of Switzerland, not the case of the USA. They had great leaders. They had their great founding fathers that had all probably read these plays and uh, knew what to do, thanks to Schiller. Now, Schiller is actually writing this after the American Revolution, but he was already born in 1259 and his work it's in tandem with what is in ha happening in America and Schiller's, you know, coming off of the back of Leibniz. And um, yeah, he's just rehashing the, these ideals out. And it's uh, kind of uh, almost like a, like I said before, like a reestablishment of those ideals, those Republican ideals. And for the people in Europe probably reading it, having just witnessed what happened in America, you can see like Schiller was a dangerous guy for the oligarch. I mean, uh, having witnessed what happened had just happened in America in 1774, like, and then Schiller's writing these plays for the European populace, they almost needed someone like Napoleon to like wipe out that possibility. They saw what happened with the French Revolution. That, that was a very close escape for the oligarchy in, in terms of like remaining in power. So they, they really needed a dictator to come in and kind of restore what they consider order, which is more oppression, not order, but yes. So here we have, this is the scene. We're gonna start reading the play now. 
This is the scene. On the right side, you have the Lake of Luzern. I don't know if anybody's been there, but it's absolutely divine. And uh, right here where this photo is taken, looking across, on the lower side of that mountain is the Rudley Plain. And on the left side here are the men, the three men from Uri, Schweiz and Unterwalden from the three different cantons. We're going to get into their characters now who uh, declare this oath. Um, it's, and Schiller makes it in two parts, actually, because in the old version, it appears to me from what I've read that the oath was done like it, it kind of like didn't have much planning or it doesn't appear to. Schiller actually really specifies that there was a preamble to the de to their Rutli oath. So there's a meeting that we're going to read now in scene four. Actually, no, I changed my mind. First, I want to go through the first <clears throat> scene because I think the beginning and endings of art are so important to set the tone. Schiller's words would do better justice than I will. To really set the tone of what what the base of this play is and who it's for. So I'm going to bring that up on screen now and uh, I'll assign some characters. So this is actually scene one. We're going to go back to, sorry, that's scene four. We're going to go back to the beginning because it's not that long and I just kind of blazed through it this morning and was like, yeah, we've got to do the beginning. It's so, uh, it's very fun. And, uh, starts on such a great optimistic note. Uh, we have a fisher boy, a herdsman and an alpine hunter. And then we have uh, Ruadi, Kuani and Verni. So these are, so we can see from there, this Ruadi is the fisherman. Hey Nick, uh, are we supposed to be able to see the text right now? Yes, can you not? No, we still oh. see PowerPoint. Ah, okay, hang on then, can you share? Yes. You're a okay. Got it? <clears throat> mm hmm Great. So um, it opens with like these kind of abstract characters, like he hasn't given them names. I'm kind of guessing that these people who set the original tone of the play are these characters, I think. Anyway, Ruadi is a fisherman, Bernie is a hunter who climbs from the rocks, and Kuwani is a herdsman and Steffi is his handyman. So can I ask Matt to do the Fisher Boy and uh, Ruadi? And can I ask Hugh to do the Herdsman and Kuwani? And I will do the Alpine Hunter and um, Verney. Is that good? Mm -hmm. Great. Can I do one too? Oh, of course, Magdalena. Then look, you can take Seppi's place. Seppi? Yeah. Okay. Scrap that. Magdalena, oh. you do Baumgarten because he's going to come, come in later on. Oh, okay. Okay, I'll just read the synopsis here quickly. Um, the lake makes a cove in the land. A hut is not far from the shore. Fisher boy conveys himself in a boat. Across the lake, one sees the green meadows, villages and farms lie in the bright sunshine. To the left of the spectator, the peaks of the Hucken show themselves, surrounded by clouds. To the right, in the distance, hint the ground, one sees the ice-covered mountains. Even before the curtain rises, one hears the cowherd's dance and the harmonious chime of the cattle bells, which continues for some time, even during the opening scene. Fisher boy sings in boat. Do I have to sing everything I'm about to say? <laughs> no, but you can, you know, give it a <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, melody of the cowherd's dance. I guess I'm supposed to know what that sounds like. <clears throat> The lake it doth smile, to having it calleth. The boy asleep on the verdant shore falleth. There, here, 
There hears he a ringing, like flute tones so nice, like voices of angels in paradise. And as he awakens in happiness blessed, their waters are washing him round the breast. And it calls from the bottom, thwart mine, lady dear, entice I the sleeper, I pull him in here. Mm. Hertzman, Hugh. Hugh? Um, ye pastures, farewell. Ye meadows are glowing. The herdsman is going. The summer is hence. We go to the mount. Return we'll be making. When the cuckoo calls, when the songs are awaking. When, the, with, when with flowers the earth itself new doth array. When the fountains flow in the loveliest May. Ye pastures, farewell. Ye meadows are glowing. The herdsman is going. The summer is hence. The heights are a-thundering, now trembles the bridge. Nor feareth the archer on dizzying ridge. He strideth undaunted o'er the ice-covered fields. No spring there is flaunted, no shoot there green yields. And under the footsteps, a mist-covered sea, no longer the cities of man doth he see. Through the rift of clouds only he glimpses the world. Deep under the water green fields are unfurled. The landscape is altered. One hears a muffled crack from the mountains. Shadows of clouds move across the region. Ruadi, the fisherman, comes out of the hut. Verni, the hunter, climbs upon the rocks. Kuani, the herdsman, comes with the milk pail on his shoulder. And Sepi, his handyman, follows him. Ruadi, please. Who's that? I think it's you. Aha. Be speedy, Jenny. Haul the boat ashore. The grizzled veil lord comes. Dull roars the glacier. The Mittenstein is drawing on his cap, and from the weather cleft a cold, a cold wind blows. The storm, I think, will be here, ere we know it. Rain's coming, ferryman. My sheep are eating the grass, I'm sorry, my sheep are eating the grass with greed, and watcher paws the earth. The fish are springing, and the waterfowl dies below. A storm is now approaching. Look, Seppi, that the cattle have not strayed. I recognize Brown Liesel by her bell. So, we are missing none. I'm sorry, it keeps moving. Uh, so, we are missing none. She goes the farthest. A pretty peal of bells there, Master, uh, <clears throat> Master Herdsman. And handsome cows. They're yours, compatriot. <laughs> I'm not so rich. They are my gracious lords of Attenkhausen's, and to me entrusted. How, f how fair the band appears on that cow's neck. Ah, uh, that knows she too, that she doth lead the herd. And I took, and took I it from her, she ceased to feed. That makes no sense. A cow devoid of reason? Yeah, <laughs> that's easy said. The beast have reason too. That's known to us. We men who hunt the chamois, who shrewdly post when they to pasture go, a sentinel, who pricks his ears and warns with piercing whistle when the hunter nears. You, you drive them home? The Alp is grazed quite bare. Safe journey home, my friend. That I wish you. Not all your trips are ended in return. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, it's moving kind of fast there. Sorry, there. Aha. Uh -huh. There comes a man who rushes with great haste. I know him. It is Baumgart of Altselen. Conrad mm. Baumgart and rushing in breathless. May God be willing, ferryman, your boat! Now, now, what is the hurry? Cast off now. You must save me from death. Set me across. Compatriot, what's wrong? Who follows you? Haste, haste them. Even now they're close upon my heels. The governor's troopers are in hot pursuit. I am a man of death if I'm seized. Why are the troopers in pursuit of you? First, rescue me, and then I'll talk to you. Oh, you're defiled with blood. What have occurred? The emperor's castellan, who at Rosberg sat. The Wolfenscheisen? He's pursuing you? He'll harm no man again. I've, I've vet him dead. 
Ah. May God forgive you. What is it you've done? What any free man in my place had done, I have exercised my household right against him who hath defiled my mine honor and my... A Castilian hath your honor then impaired? That he did, not his evil lust fulfilled. Has God and my good acts alone prevented? You've split his head in two then with your axe? Oh, let us hear, you've time enough, before he hath the boat unfastened from the shore. I've been felling timber in the woods, when ran my wife toward me in mortal fear. The castellan quartered in my house, he had commanded her to get a bath prepared. And when he had indecencies of her demanded, she escaped to search for me. Then ran I brisk there too, just, I was, just as I was. And with the axe, I've blessed his bath for him. Uh, you've acted well. No man can blame you for it. A maniac. Now hath he his reward. T'was long deserved from Unterwalden's people. The deed was noised about. I am pursued. And while we are speaking, God, the time is flying. Quick, Ferryman, <clears throat> convey this man across. It can't be done. A violent storm is now approaching. You must wait. Oh, holy God, I cannot wait. The least delay is death. Set out with God. One must assist his neighbor. The light can happen to each of us. Uh, <clears throat> the phone is loose. See how the water rise. I cannot steer against the storm it waves. So must I fall into the tyrant's hands? His life's at stake. Have mercy, ferryman. He is a father and hath wife and children. So what? I have a life as well to lose. Have wife and children at home like he. Look how it surges, how it heaves and wh whirlpools draw. And all the water rouses from the depths. I would be glad to save this worthy man, yet it's impossible. So you see yourself. So must I fall into the tyrant's hands. The shore of rescue now so near to sight. Like it's yonder. I can reach it with my eyes. My voice's sound can make its way across. Here is the boat that would convey me hence. And must I lie here, helpless and forlorn? Look, who is now come here? It's Tell from Berglund. Who wants to do Tell? Christine? Oh, Christine's uh, sound isn't very good. I can, I can do it. Sorry. Yeah, go for it, Dave. Okay, sir. I just wasn't uh, following. Tell. No worries. I'm going to tell us from the top here. Yeah, perfect. Who is the man who here implores for help? It's an Alzheimer man. He hath his honor defended, and the Wolfenscheisen slain, the castling of the king who sat at Rossburg. The governor's troopers are upon his heels. He begs the boatman, carry him across, but he's afraid of the storm and will not go. Now here's Tell. He steers the rudder too. He'll be my witness, should the trip be dared. Need be ferryman. All may be ventured. Am I to plunge into the jaws of hell? That none would do who did possess his senses. The valiant man thinks of himself the last. Put trust in God and rescue the distressed. Secure in port, tis easy, tis easy to advise. Here is the boat, and there is the lake. Attempt it. The lake can pity, but the governor will not. Attempt it, boatman. Save, Save him. him. Save, Save him. him. Save, Save him. him. And to where my brother and my very child it cannot be. Tis Simon Judah Day. Uh, Judah Day. Here raves the lake and wants to have its victim. With idle talk, Will nothing here be done? The hour insists. The man must now be helped. Speak, boatman. Will thou take him? No, not I. In the name of God, then. Give the boat to me. I will attempt it with my feeble strength. Ah, valiant tell. That is the hunter's way. You are my savior of an angel, tell. I'll save you from the power of the governor. From peril of storm, another must give aid. Yet betterest 
you fall into God's hands than into men's, the herd's compatriot. Consult my wife if something human falls to me. I've done, but I would, but I, but what I could never not leave undone. You are a master of the helm, but tell hath dared to do that could not you have ventured? Our better men do not take Tell's example. There are not, there are not two like he is in the mountains. He pushes off. God help thee, valiant swimmer. See how the bark is reeling on the waves. The surge is passing fence. I can't see no more. Yet, wait, here it appears again. Robustly, the valiant man is working through the breakers. The governor's troopers come now at full gallop. God knows they are, and that was help in need. Okay. Yes, we can continue. I'll do the troopers. I can do the trooper. Oh, okay, great. Lazarus, you do the first, I'll do yes. the second. Yes. Give up the murder. You have con give up the murder you have concealed. This way he came. In vain you're hiding him. Who mean you, trooper? trooper. Covers the boat. Ha! What see I? Devil! Isn't he in yonder boat you seek? <laughs> right on. If you lay quickly too, you'll haul him in. I guess I'll do the second trooper. Yeah, go for it. Accursed! He hath escaped. To the herdsman fisherman. You've helped him to escape. You'll pay us for it. For it. All upon their herds. Tear down the cottage, burn and strike it down. Ah, my poor lambs. Oh, woe is me, my herds. Oh, these berserkers. Righteous, righteousness of heaven. When will the savior come into this land? Great work, everyone. Thank you. That was, yeah, well read. So, I mean, now I want to open the discussion up a bit because I think it's uh, art we should have fun with it and uh this is what we do at work too so when we're talking about the context of something we really just got to get these ideas and juices flowing so anybody who has any ideas about what's taking place here um any takers any anybody wants to kind of give a stab at like the context and the form of this like what we're what Schiller's playing with in in idea and what he's trying to generate in us um, the um, so coming from Switzerland I just want to give a little background because um, where I grew up and I'm in the north I'm not very very close to where this whole action is taking place but okay even where I live within a 50 kilometers uh, uh, surrounder surrounding area you had about six castles on top of the hills and these are all from the Habsburg castles okay so this is what Switzerland was like at the time you had massive massive feudalism um, run by the Habsburgs and the people of Switzerland were basically yeah they were serfs they were treated very badly I mean all of their produce largely was taken uh, for the empire anything that they made or did was basically controlled by the empire yeah so you basically sorry lazarus so um whatever the swiss people made uh was taken as tribute to the uh to the uh, to the habsburgs right exactly but in in this play like what what's happening here in this conversation like, what is the specifics of this? I mean, at first, because it kind of changes as we go through it. Well, I get a sense of uh, uh, men scrambling together to in a in a state of urgency. Yeah, that that's happening towards the end. But when we open the play, what do we open with? Like the the three people that pop out of the mountain, the herdsman, the alpine hunter, the the. Uh, Fisher boy, what do they represent for us? Common people. Exactly. Common people. Common people. They're trying to get their work done before the storm comes. Before storm. Exactly. So it's a pretty uh, natural will. Like it's it's a a day-to-day -day thing. These people are going about their lives peacefully. 
and then, we, we have a disturbance in the first scene, actually. The we, storm coming. Yes, the, the, the harmony is disturbed by the storm, not just the storm, no. The storm's like a metaphor for something that's actually happening literally in front of our very eyes. Yeah, I'm... We have an attempted rape. Yeah, yeah. And why? Do we know why? What's Baum Baumgarten? Do we know who Baumgarten is? Did I, did I say? Did I? Because everything, everything is all good at first, right? I mean, they're, they're largely talking about their jobs and, and about the fact that a storm is coming, but yeah. the storm has two meanings, actually. Not, not just the actual storm, but yeah. a greater storm. Like, like a, a kind of realization of, of action that we must take. I mean, there's a storm in that too, like in the sense of there's a conflict in these people. They're being forced under an oppressive state, but they're not like that. They don't live their day-to-day -day life like that. There are free people who work under natural conditions and they bow to the mountains and they bow to nature, but they don't bow to man. I mean, I feel like there's two um, there's two systems of lawfulness that become more clear once uh, hell shows up. In the sense that, I mean, we can relate to, I like the guy. There's a guy who's in danger. He's got this ty tyrannical system that's after him. Yeah. And what is the sort of instinctual? Uh, reaction of anybody i mean just based on evolution and everything it's well we gotta run from danger uh we have to take care of our families we have to survive so yeah. it's a purely sort of survival instinct argument and i mean we understand that i mean we're we're sort of you know human beings are that's part of our nature we're designed to survive you know and sort of perpetuate uh reproduce and you know protect our our future like that but it poses a higher question because this is all happening under tyranny and here you have so i mean your family's living under tyranny your and your your grandchildren your great grandchildren that's that's a fixed system you know yeah. you, you could choose to let your family reproduce under this system and just sort of uh keep to your local pairwise interaction with all your little local system but will tell introduces a higher system right the reality is that there is a higher lawfulness organizing your what you perceive as your immediate local environment and he's challenging that which is very scary i mean anybody i mean any you know we all have to chiller wants us to put ourselves in the place of both the commoners which we can identify with but also in the place of Tell, who even in the face of danger, he has a family and everything. And it's like you, uh, I mean, I think this comes after, but I think it's fine to mention it now, you know, his wife or somebody gives Tell shit after like you yeah. stupid man so much shit. who could have died. What would have happened to your family? Yeah. Sh shame on you. How irresponsible. Right. And that's the sort of, common reaction that's the instinctual reaction but the question is how do you deal with this higher system of laws you have a system of tyranny and you're never going to change that if you just think from the standpoint of survival i mean that's the whole point of the system of tyranny it's to just get people to think in terms of survival to think like beasts yes so i mean there's something called creativity which allows us to challenge such an arbitrary uh, system. And I think that's the point that Tell is sort of transcending. Yeah, he might die, but that's forcing us to recognize that there isn't just this system of arbitrary laws, but there is a higher system of lawfulness. Yeah. And what kind of character do you need to actually uh, act based on knowledge of this higher system of lawfulness? It's scary, but it's also <laughs> sort of, you know, Schiller calls this a sublime. Yeah, beautifully said, Dave. Thank you. I mean, like in this statement right here that Tell says, everything that uh, Dave just said, like that personifies Tell, this statement. The valiant man thinks of himself last, 
put trust in God and rescue the distressed. It's such a simple line and it's so natural, but it, for him, it's like easy, you know, like that's the naturalness of it, like that Shiller puts forth, like this is tell, like he's just arrived on the scene and as Dave just, you know, spelled out to us, like he provides this higher lawfulness, this higher morality where he's like, you know, and, and that makes him a natural born leader as well, right? So if we, if we look into, you know, well, I'm not going to go there, but like if you look into Plato and things like that, you'll see, again, similarities in these figures. Uh, like the philosopher king doesn't necessarily just have to be a king, basically, is what I'm trying to say. It can be just a common citizen who elevates themselves to a place of lawfulness, like they've just said, which will lead people to a greater recognition of their independence and their liberty and so on and so forth. Uh, just for the record, sorry, Nick, uh, I, I, I also, I don't know where the class is, where I, but I was listening, part of what I, a good deal of what I've said is based on uh, me listening to a class by uh, Jerry Rose, who right. spoke of Schiller's Will and Tell, and, and he sort of pretty much said what I said, I just kind of put it in my own words, and yeah. things that I've been thinking about recently. But uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll try and find, there's a great class on tragedy by Jerry Rose, where he talks about Schiller and Shakespeare. If you could leave it in the, if you could find it and leave it in the comment section, that'd be great, Dave. It only adds the people's insight into these things. And like Dave just said, it's so great when you can make a discovery your own. It's okay, like we are taught things, but the learning has to become something that is, it's in us, not external. Like it has to actually become part of our character. And we, we become the driving, the, the driver behind the car. Like we literally drive our own destiny. Nick, can I share a quick thought? Yes, please go. I mean, the, the floor is open. Prend la parole. Okay. Uh, what really struck me is when I look at what uh, uh, Schiller articulates as uh, Baumgarten's um, uh, challenging situation, if I can put it in that euphemism, uh, it really brought to mind the Epstein story in our current time, if you will. And if you think of Randy Andy and, and the suspicion that this <laughs> is far more prolific than uh, is generally recognized, it seems to me that Schiller is uh, coming across and bringing forth sort of a, a timeless issue that still has not been resolved even today. And it's almost like an eternal struggle between, uh, and this might get back to Matt's uh, thoughts earlier of two competing economic systems. It might be more than just two competing economic systems, but, but uh, entirely uh, diametrically opposed worldviews as to what constitutes decency and morality and, and so on and so forth. So when I look at uh, this play, and I'll be honest, I'm not familiar with Schiller's work, I'm really struck by the, I'll call it the eternal uh, relevance of it. That's what Schiller does. I mean, yeah, wonderfully said. Um, I'm going to talk about economies later a little bit and kind of improvise that and, and talk about Switzerland and its economy and so on and so forth and also Belt and Road versus Western Imperial imperialism um, or like the NATO system, the NATO structure. Um, also, just taking on, going a little bit more on Stephen's comment, it's also a way of looking at people as things or beings. You know, things who can be used and discarded versus beings who must be honored because they are a, a being just like us and going on in their being just like us. Absolutely. So, so when at the beginning I spoke about what is the role of culture and whose duty is it to uphold it, you're kind of getting at that, that answer right there. It's that it's really ours. And, and our, the independence lies in that, right? Like how much is each and every citizen willing to put aside their own central worries or concerns or fears to to rise above and lead not just themselves but the people in their immediate circle and hopefully in the future others by the the grandness of their ideas to, to a, a higher form of living generally speaking and that because that's the beautiful thing about art right like you can metaphysically create a vision before it has been, before it has come. You can even take something from the past and readapt it to have an even greater meaning and, and re-envision even the past. So even the past isn't a static thing. It's not just, not just a static sequence of events, you know, or like 
separate sequence of events. They are part of the whole history of mankind. And it is all linked and it is all, it's a family of events rather than, you know, they're, they're the, the causes and effects and so on and so forth. Like what, you know, any other class that you've seen maybe from Assad last week, like you'll see that what happened in Arabia or in the Islamic world, not just indirectly, but directly affects what's happening in Europe and other places. So culture is never separated, like history is not separated. Nothing that is human can actually really be separated. So, yes, we're drawing on on that kind of question a little bit more there. That's great. Thanks, Hugh. So, I'd like, we've got three characters in this. They're the three men from the three different cantons. It starts with Arnold von Melktau, who is from Unterwalden. He's the son of a very rich uh, landowner in uh, uh, Unterwalden. And these men are basically respected amongst their peers and amongst the citizenry. Walter Wurst is from Uri, and uh, Stauffacker, who's going to come in later because he is uh, kind of, well, he's, yeah, he's looking for someone, and you're going to find out who. So can I ask for some readers again? Anybody, any takers? Hugh? Hugh and Lazarus? Hugh had to leave, unfortunately. Um, Assad, I know, is hungry to read. Yeah, I could do something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Cynthia also is volunteering. Oh, it's such a shame Hugh had to leave. He's such a great yeah. reader. Anyway. Um, so, who wants to do Milk Towel? Assad. All right. Uh, just so you know, Melktau, uh, he's pissed. Okay. <laughs> uh, Vultaverst. <clears throat> Magdalena. Yeah, okay. Yeah, he's, really, like, he's a more level, level-minded level guy. And uh, Stauffacher is going to come in later. Uh, Lazarus, you can do Stauffacher, yeah? So we're in a house. Take it away. Whoa. Okay. Melktau. Lord Wartel Forst. A visual to surprise. Stay where you are. We are beset by spies. You bring me not from Underwalden, not from my dear father. I can't, I can bear no longer. You lie here idly like a prisoner. What have I done then that's so criminal that I just, that I should hide just like a murderer? Oh, the brazen rascal, who would drive away from me the oxen, my most excellent team? Before mine eyes on orders from the governor, I have but with my stuff the finger broken. You are too rash. The rascal was the governor's. He was dispatched by your superiors. You have received, you have received the penalty. You should, as harsh it was, have paid it silently. Should I have uh, countenanced the flippant talk of one so unashamed? If peasants want their bread, then let them pull the plow themselves. It cut me to the soul to see the knave unyoke the oxen. Beauteous creatures from the plow, they bellowed low as though they had the sense of some abuse and struck out with their horns. Here I was overwhelmed by righteous anger. And of myself, not Lord, and of myself, not Lord, I struck the messenger. Oh, scarcely do we master our own hearts. How should the hasty youth restrain himself? I pity but the father. He demands so much attention and his sons away. The governor's hateful, the governor's hateful to him since he ever had striven honestly from right and freedom. So therefore they will harry the old man and there is none who shields him from affront. Come what may, come what may come with me, I must go over. Just wait and patiently compose yourself until reports come to us from yon forest. I hear a knocking, go, perhaps a message from the governor. Go in there, you are not saving Yuri for the London burger's arm since tyrants give a hand to one another. 
they're teaching us what we should do. Now go. I'll call you back when it's safe out here. It's you, Magdalena, to continue. I don't. Where are we? I got the wretched, the wretched man. Oh, the wretched man. I may not. I may not now confess to him what evil I suspect. Who knocks? So off the door doth creep appear disaster. Mistrust and treason lurk in every corner. Into the house's inmost rooms the bearers of power penetrate. Soon we shall need to place a lock and key upon our doors. Oops. Okay. What see I? You, Lord Werner? Now, by God. A worthy and cherished guest. No better man hath ever walked across this threshold yet. You're highly welcome underneath my roof. What brings you here? What seek you here in Uri? The olden times and olden Switzerland. You bring them with you? Look how I rejoice. My heart grows warm upon the side of you. Sit down, Lord Werner. How do you depart from Lady Gertrude, your most pleasant wife, sagacious Ivers, highly prudent da daughter? By all the wanderers from the German lands who crossed the Mindrad cell to Italy, your hospitality is praised. But say, have you just come directly from Blue Island hence? And did you look in any other place before you placed your foot upon this threshold? Can't see. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yes, an astonishing new work I've seen in preparation. In preparation, with which I'm not pleased. Oh, friend, you have it then with with but one glance. A thing like that has never been in Uri. In human memory, was no prison here, nor dwelling fortified except the grave. A grave of freedom, is it? You name its name. Lord Walter first. I won't hold back with you. No idle curiosity can <clears throat> here. I'm pressed by heavy cares. Oppression I've left at home. Oppression I find here. Find I here. For it's sufferable, insufferable, what we endure. And there's no end in sight to this distress. Free hath the, Swe the Schweitzer been from ancient times. We are accustomed to be treated well. The like of this was in the land near No. So long a herdsman drove upon these mountains. Yes, this unparalleled how they are acting. Even our noble lord of Attinghausen, who hath the ancient times still seen himself, believes it is no longer to be born. Below yon forest goes it poorly too, and bloody the and bloody it's and bloody is the penance. Wolfenschiessen, the emperor's governor, who dwelt in, who dwelt at Rossberg, he had a longing for forbidden fruit. Baumgarten's wife, that keeps the house in Alzalen, he wished to misuse her to bold excess. And with his axe, the man hath struck him dead. Oh, righteous are the judgments of the Lord. Baumgarten, do you say? A modest man. He's rescued, surely, and he's well concealed. Your son-in-law took him across the lake, and I, kept, I keep him hidden in my house in Stein. Yet more atrocious things hath this man conveyed to me of, what have, of what's been done in Sarnet. The heart of every honest man must bleed. Say on, what is it? In, 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 uh, in Melktau, where one goes into Kerns, there lives an upright man. They call him Heinrich von der, or Heinrich von der Halden. And his voice is of some weight in the assembly. Uh, who knows him not? What is it with him? Proceed. The Landenberger penalized his son for some small misdeed, ordered his best pair of oxen to be unharnessed from the plow. The boy struck him, struck the knave and took to fight. 
And yet the father say, how is it with him? The lamb and burger had the fight, had the father summoned. He should have, he should produce his son upon the spot. And as the old man swore with truthfulness that he knew nothing of the fugitive, the governor ordered torturers to come. Oh, hush, no more. Hey, um, e'en hath the son escaped me, yet have I thee. Has him thrown to the ground, the pointed steel plunged into his eye. Merciful heaven! In his eyes, you say? Astonished to Walter first. Who is the youth? Into his eyes? Speak on. Oh, the lamentable old man. Who isn't? And I had, and I had to be hanged. This, this is the son. Oh, this is. Yeah, that's for Lazarus still. This yeah. is the son. Oh, is this the son? Oh, righteous God. And I had to be hence into both of his eyes. Restrain yourself and do it like a man. Because of my offense, of my misdeed. He is blinded then, really blind and fully blinded? I say it, the fountain of his sight runs out, the sights run out. The sunlight, oh, the sunlight he will ne'er behold again. Oh, spare his oh, anguish. Spare his anguish. Never, never more. He presses his hand upon his eyes and is silent a few moments. Then he turns from the one to the other and speaks with a gentle voice choked by tears. Melktow. That's you, Asad. Sorry. Uh, oh. Oh, what a noble gift of heaven is the light of the eye. For every being lives from light, and each and every happy creature, the plants themselves turn joyously towards light, and he might sit there feeling in the night, in constant darkness. He's refreshed no more by meadows of warm green, the flowers graze, the flowers glaze, the reddish glaciers he can see no more. To die is not to live and not to see. That's misery. What do you look at me so grievously? Why do you look at me so grievously? I have two lively eyes and can give neither to my blinded father nor any shimmer from the sea of light that splendid dazzling breaks upon my uh, mine eyes. Lazarus. Alas, I must enlarge your, I must enlarge your sorrow further instead of healing it. He still he wants still more. The governor hath stolen all from him. Not hath he left him except his staff to wander bare and blind from door to door. Not but his staff to the sightless aged man, everything robbed and even the light of the sun, the common good of the poorest wretch. Now speak to me no more of staying or of hiding. What kind of wretched coward have I been that, I might, that, that of mine own security I thought and not of thine? Thy precious head left us security within the tyrant's hands. Faint-hearted caution, travel hence on naught but bloody retribution shall I think. I will go over there, no one shall stop me, and from the governor claim my father's eyes. I'll give him even in the midst of all his mounted men, life is but naught to me. If I can only quench this feverish, enormous pain in his life's blood. Remain. What could you do to him? He sits in silent upon his lofty, lordly keep and scoffs at unavailing wrath in his safe fortress. And lived he yonder in, my, in the icy palace of Schreckenhorn or much higher where the Jungfrau sits veiled eternally. I still would make my way to him with only 20 youths disposed like I with I would break the, then I would break his 
fortress. And if none follows me, if you all so frightened for your huts and for your herds, bow down before the tyrant's yoke, I'll call the herdsmen all together in the mountains. There underneath the open roof of heaven, where, where still the mind is fresh and heart is sound, relate the story of this monstrous horror. It hath now reached its, height, reached its height. Are we to wait until the last extreme? What last extreme is to be feared yet? If the stars of the eyes, if the star of the eyes in safe no longer in its, cav in its cavity, are we defenseless? Wherefore do, did we learn to bend the bow and swing the heavy weight of battle axes? Every creature had been granted a defense in, in its despair. The exhausted stag will take a stand and show its dreaded antlers to the pack of hounds. The camua drags the hunter in the abyss. The ox itself, the gentle fellow lodger of man, who bends the enormous power of his neck with patience underneath the yoke, springs up unprovoked, wets his gigantic horns and slings his enemy up to the clouds. If the three contents thought as we three men, so then might we perhaps accomplish something? If Uri calls, if Unterwald, if Unterwalden helps, the Schweitzer will revere the ancient bond. In Unterwalden, I have many friends, and each would risk his life and limb with joy. And each would risk his life and limb with joy, and if if he had uh, back up from the from the others and a shield o pious father of this land i'm I, i'm standing here now but a youth between you the much experienced my voice must be discreetly silent in the land's assembly because i'm young and know not much of life do not disdain my counsel and my speech not lustful youth blood impels me not lustful youth not Lustful, youthful blood impels me, but the painful violence of the greatest woe, which even the stone or the rock must move to pity. You both are fathers, heads of both your houses, and you desire to have a virtuous son who will revere your head's most sacred locks and piously protect your eyesight star. Oh, since you, you both have suffered nothing in limb and property, your eyes to themselves alert and bright within, this, within their spheres. So therefore be not distant to our need. The tyrant sword hangs over you as well. You've turned away the land of Austria. My father's crime was nothing more than that. You share an equal guilt and condemnation. Lazarus. Oh, yeah. Do you decide? Do you decide? I do you decide. I am prepared to follow. We wish to hear what do the noble lords of Sillinen and Ottinghouse advise. Their names, I think, will wanna, will will win us over friends. Where's where's there a name within the forest mountains that's worthier than yours or that of yours? The people do believe in the, in the genuine worth of names like these. Their ring is good in the country. Rich was your heritage in my in father's virtue, and richly you have enlarged on it. What need of noblemen? Let's finish, let's, let's finish it alone. Were we indeed alone the land? I think we'd, we'd know already how to shield ourselves. The noble's plight is not the same as ours. The stream which raises, which rages in the lower grounds till now hath not yet reached unto the heights, but they will not refuse us their support when they see, when they once see the country up in arms. Were there between us and Austria an empire, so then would justice and the law decide, but he who doth oppress us is our emperor and highest judge. So therefore, God must help us through our own arm. Now you seek out the men of Schwitz. 
and Alvin over friends in Uri. But whom are we to send to Unterwalden? Send me over there. Whom should it be more whom should it more concern? Let me go. No, I won't allow it. You're my guest. I have to guarantee your safety. Let, Let me, me go. I know the byways and the rocky paths. Friends too. Yeah. That's Sorry, right. Lazarus. It's uh, Assad. Oh. <laughs> Let me go. I know the byways and the rocky paths. Friends too, I find enough who'll hide me from the enemy and gladly give me shelter. Let him go with God. To, let, let him go with God over there. Over there, there are no traitors. So detested is this tyranny that it can find no tool. Below the, below the forest, too, should the Alzalan recruit Confederates and rouse the land. How shall we safely then communicate that we deceive suspicions of tyrants? We could perhaps arrange to meet at tribe or Brunin. Where the uh, merchant, uh, where, where the merchant vessels land. So openly we may not go to work. Hear my idea. To the left of the lake, on the way to Brunnen, opposite the Mittenstein, a meadow lease con lies concealed within the woods. It's called the Rudli by the shepherd folk, because the timber there was all uprooted. That's where our canton's boundary and yours. I can't see. Adjoin each other. Adjoin each other and a little trip. In your light boat bears you across from Schwitz. Upon the third upon the third pass can we go thence at night and quietly deliberate. Let each bring there with him ten trusted men who are at one with us within their hearts. So then may we discuss the common cause in common and with God resolve afresh. So be it. Now give your staunch right hand to me and give yours as well. And thus we three men have now among ourselves entwined our hands in, de in honesty without deception. So too shall we th three cantons stand together in defense and in offense Death and life. In death and life. In life. Great stuff. Oh, there's a bit more. Sorry. They leave. Uh, Vorteburst and Stauffacker leave. Melktal is left alone to lament a little more. Melktal. Asad. Oh, blinded, aged father. Thou canst no longer see the day of freedom. But thou shalt hear it from... Thou shalt hear it when from elf to elf the fiery signals rise aloft in flame, the sturdy castles of the tyrants fall, unto thy cottage shall the Schweizer, Schweizer travel to carry to thine ear the joyous news, and in thy night shall it be day to thee. Brilliant. Thank you, guys. That is a challenging one. Like, I, I must admit, it's quite the text. And in that last paragraph there, we actually see what Magdalena was talking at, about before, where she set the scene for us, where there are these castles, uh, you know, on the mountains surrounding Switzerland and within Switzerland. And um, also the, the fiery signals rise aloft in flame. This is the signal to a call to arms for Switzerland. So yeah, let's again, uh, just quickly, before we move on to the final actual Rootley Oath. Um, what's going on here? Any takers or? Well, there is a, there is a countenance of all the different terrible deeds that have been done to the people of uh, Schwitz, Uri and Unterwalden. Yeah. Um, the rape and the blinding of the old man and the un taking away of the oxen and just the way people have been, yeah, basically a, a list of terrible things. Yeah, they catalog all the lists of uh, tyranny. So uh, yeah. it's almost as though they're going through them as well, that they're kind of almost convincing themselves Yeah. of, of the just acts that they're, they're kind of now starting to convince themselves that they're actually willing to take. So in this conversation, I think we start to see the reckoning 
of, of what's going to take place later. So they're starting to organize themselves in a really natural way, actually. They've listed the tyranny. They've, they've listed the singular acts that are being placed upon them. And they're starting to come to the conclusion that they, you know, they always have a choice, but the, the choice is getting thinner for them. And, and they're starting to, and they feel something pulling them towards this just act. It's, it's, and there's this wonderful moment here where, you know, Stauffacher and Volta Verst, if we, if we were to go into the characters more and, and develop them more within ourselves as we read it, you, you see that Volta Verst and Stauffacher, they're of a different age completely to Melktau. Melktau is young. He's not only young, his father's just had his eyes poked out. So he's really, really like suffering. You know, and he's like, I'm ready to take up arms and do it by myself. Like, he's really angry. And the two older guys, they're kind of like, well, we've been around a while, you know. And, and it's kind of interesting, right? Because they're, they're maybe a little bit at the beginning more considering their security. And, you know, also they don't want to make a rash act because they know that when they did that probably as younger men that they often faltered. If you if you just were to go into anarchy and riot, like they know that that's not going to change anything. Melktau is a little bit more of the lustful, um, you know, central will, and he's been hurt, and so therefore Melktau left alone could actually be a, a dangerous character, right? Because it, the the senses are pulling him towards acts that will be chaotic and yeah. not. All that they're, they're probably not going to bring about much good for the future. So that, it, right? Yeah. So that we see Schiller's really uh, painting these ironies, and it's really a beautiful thing how the older generation is almost, is actually educating Melktau and channeling his feelings uh, to this higher level of action. So you see it happening in him as, in this moment. And uh, they, they point out the dangers as well at the end there. They're like, we have to be careful how we go about this because, you know, basically none of this will work if, if it becomes, you know, public information. Like, we'll, we'll, we'll fail at the first hurdle. So Melktau's obviously listening to this and like, okay. And he starts to calm down and starts to organize his feelings, actually, led by them. But you still need that. You still need Melktau to get angry. You know, we still have to care. You know, it comes from a place of love. He can't deny the love for his father. We all know that, that's family. And so that love really shines through as a feeling. And he's like, I'm willing to go to the end of the earth to get back at these guys. He has to have a passion. Right. But that left alone will not actually lead you to any greater action. It must be a moral issue too, how you go about it, how we organize it. And that's what being political is. So... As we are getting quite late in the day, I'm going to skip forward to the actual Rootley Oath now. So let me just go back to the content. It comes quite soon after, actually. They they are moving quite fast. There's only five acts in this place, so never a dull. I, I, really, wanted, I really wanted to hear a scene with Gertrude when she tells her husband what he ah, needs to do. I knew it. Oh my God. Do you want to do it? <laughs> I read it just before. <laughs> and you know i was saying to julia because i was like you know what it's so like anybody who's a feminist should read Schiller because they'll see that like all of these women are actually the like, like they're the original idea gertrude's the one yes who's in stauffacher starts getting him thinking like in in our no come on should we read it <laughs> i don't know like we're running out of time but everyone should read it because before Stauffacher comes to this house, right? Literally just before, it's in scene. Is it in scene three? No, it's in scene two. And he's at home with his wife, Gertrude, who's this real robust woman. She's she's a real force of nature, this one. And she he's telling her about these things that are happening out in public and brings the message back home. And instantly she's like, no. Like, this is nuts. Like, we've, we've got to do something about this. And he's like, calm yourself, woman. Like, what do you think will happen to me if I, you know, if I go fighting wars? What's going to happen to you if I die? She's like, oh, I care not for myself. 
don't worry about me. There'll be nothing left of me if this is if like if this nation becomes ruled by an empire. Like I'd rather die just than live a life of you know oppression. So like it's kind of like what we got to lose, you know. And it's great because actually you you see like in these women that they're they're like stronger than their men in will at least the willpower of them is like. Behind, you know, the great saying, like, behind every great man is an even greater woman. And Schiller really does nail this in. He's like, yeah, they all have these wives that are really, mm-hmm. like, drumming the message into them. And it's a really beautiful thing. Um, Schiller likes to do that a lot. And he's really, like, uh, he actually wrote a poem called On the Dignity of Women. Mm-hmm. Uh, everyone should check it out. And, uh, yeah, way ahead of his time. Sorry, Magdalena, we're gonna we're gonna go to the room. I would love to, really, I would, I really would. But uh, everyone can read it and you'll see what I mean. Yeah. So let's move on. It's uh, a meadow surrounded by high rocks and woods. We have who do we have? Oh, we have quite a lot in this one. Yeah. Uh, this is the declaration. So right here, they're on the mountain. Um, who wants, yeah, Lazarus, you can stick with Mechtal. Sure. Okay, uh, do I read the, uh, the rocks and the mound part? Uh, no, it's okay, I'll do that, but just okay. one sec, we're going to yeah. ascertain who's going to do the other roles too. Uh, Magdalena, you can stay as Baumgartner. Okay. I will do... Cynthia and I can do uh, two voices. Okay, great. Oh, sorry, you were doing Volta Verse, Magdalena, weren't you? You can stay with Volta Verse. Oh, okay. Is that what you want? Okay. Yeah, because okay. you did you did Baumgarten too, didn't you? Yeah. Okay, so you do Baumgarten and Volta Verse because he comes in a little bit. Okay, I'll do both. Lazarus, you do Melktau. Uh, Matt, you can do Maya von Sarnen. Christine, are you good to go? Yeah, we're just going to share the same computer. Yeah, great. That's fine. You can do the book Heart and Buell. I don't know how much these guys are going to come up. Um, most of them, are, they add in a, a little drop in. I'll do everybody else that is hasn't been ascertained. Oh, Assad, would you like to do Arnold von Sewer? No. You're, you're doing von Sewer. And I'll... Who's uh, Cynthia doing? Cynthia is doing um, Bukhart and Buell. Mm. So it's this one here, Ambuel. And Matt, your your Maya von Sarnen. And I'll do anybody else that we're missing. And uh, Asad, your von Sewer. Okay, let's take it away. Lazar- uh, I'll read the, the beginning. Oh, On the rocks are tracks with rails, also ladders, by which one later sees the countrymen descend. In the hinterground, the lake shows itself, above which at first a lunar rainbow is to be seen. The prospect is closed by high mountains, behind which still higher glaciers tower. It is completely night upon the stage. Only the lake and the white glacier shine in the moonlight. Melktau Baumgarten, Winkel Reed, Meyer von Sarnen, Buchhardt and Buell, Arnold von Sewer, Klaus von der Flue, and yet four other countrymen, all armed, have assembled on this mountain. Please take it away, Melktau. All right. The mountain pass is opening. Opening. Follow me. I know the rock and little cross thereon. We're at our goal. Here is Ruth. Where's Rutley? Hark. Deserted. There's no countrymen here yet. We are the first to come. We, Unterwagners. <clears throat> How far is the night? Is in the night? The fire watch in Seelisberg have only just called two. Hush, hark. The matin bell in the forest chapel rings clearly over here from Schweizerland. The air is pure and bears the sound so far. Go, some of you, and light some firewood. 
that it burned brightly. When the men arrive, it is a beauteous lunar night. The lake lies calmly here, just like a level mirror. <coughs> Christine? Well, you have to scroll down. Yeah, we can't see anything. Oh, sorry. It cut off. Uh, if I do like this, can you guys still see? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They have an easy voyage. Ha! Behold! Look yonder! See you not? What then? Yes, truly. A rainbow in the middle of the night. It is the light of moon that causes it. That is a passing strange and wondrous sight. There live full many who have not seen the like. Just doubled. See, a parlor runs above. A pair a of... A boat is passing underneath it now. That's Stalfacher who crosses in this boat, in, in this boat. The worthy man would not delay for long. It is Yuri who, who delayed the longest. They have to detour widely through the mountains so that they may de deceive the governor's spies. Who is it? Give the word. I'm not stopping. No, that's not me. Oh, no? All right, I'll do it. Friends of the land, be welcome. Oh, be welcome. Be welcome. Melkow. Okay. Oh, 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 Lord Stalfacher, I have him beheld who never could see me again. I've placed my hand upon his very eyes. I've drawn the burning feeling of revenge from the extinguished sunlight of his glance. Speak not of vengeance. We desire to meet the threatened evil, not avenge the past. Now say, what you in Unterwalden have achieved and listed for the common cause. How think the countrymen, how you yourself have managed to escape the snares of treason? Okay, that looks like... Okay, can you scroll down? Yes, yes, go for it. Okay. Through the Surinan's fearsome mountain range, upon the widespread empty fields of ice, where but the croaking Lammergeier cause, I reach the alpine meadow, where the herdsmen from Uri and from Ingelberg extend their greetings and in common tend, tend their flocks. My thirst relieving the, with the glacier's milk which in the runes and foams and gushes down. I stayed in isolation, and I stayed in isolated alpine huts, both mine own host and guest, until I come across the homes of social living men. Already through these valleys, words rang out of new atrocities which had occurred. In pious awe, I found my misfortune. For every gate where wandering I, I knocked. Indignant did I find these upright souls uh, about the violence of the new regime. For their alpine meadows ceaselessly give nourishment to the same plants, their springs flow uniformly. Even clouds and winds pursue unchangeably the, the self same course. So hath the ancient customs here from grandsire to grandson uh, persevere just as before. Nor do they bear the audacious innovation, I've old custom, even the way of life. Their hardened hands to me did they, they did extend. From the walls they lifted down their rusty swords. And from their eyes, they flashed a joy, joyous feeling of courage as I, spake, as I spake the names to them. Which to the mountain, which to the mountain countrymen, which to the mountain countrymen are holy, your name and that of Walter first. What you would deem is right, they swore an oath to do. They swore to follow you ere unto death. So I sped safely neath the holy shield of hospitality from farm to farm, 
as I came into my native Vale. Or Valley. Vale, Valley. Vale, Vale. Okay, where widely scattered around my cousins dwell. As I beheld my father, Rob, <laughs> Rob blind, on strangers' straw sustained by a charity of tender hearted people. Lord in heaven. Then I wept not, no, not in helpless tears did I pour out of the force of my high grief. Deep in my bosom, like a treasure, like a precious treasure, I locked it up and thought of action only. I crept through every winding of the mountain. No veil was so concealed. I spied it out onto the glacier's ice, a tired foot. Expected I have and have and found expected I and found inhabitants huts, inhabited huts. And everywhere my footsteps carried me round I the same the self same state of terror. For even at this final boundary of living nature, where the rigid earth no longer gives, the governor's greed doth, doth rob. The very heart of all honest people aroused I with the goading of my words, and all of them are and all of them are ours with hearts and mouth. Great things have you achieved in little time. I did still more. Kiss those two fortresses, Rossberg and Sardin, the countrymen both fear, fear from, from, from behind their walls of stone, that foe defends himself with ease and harms the land. With mine own eyes, I wish to study it. I went to Sardin and beheld the castle. You wished yourself, Ian, in the tiger's den? I was, <clears throat> I was disguised there in pilgrim's dress. I saw the governor feasting at the table. Now judge, if I can muster mine own heart, I saw the enemy and slew him not. Forsooth, good fortune smiled upon your boldness. Yet, tell me right away, who are the friends and upright men who followed after you? Make me acquainted with them, that we may draw near and trust and open up our hearts. Who knows? Who knows you not? Oh, who knows not you, my lord, in these three lands? My name is Meyer von Scharnen, uh, Sarnen. This one here is Struth von Winkelried, my sister's son. You do not name me any unknown names. A Winkelried it was who slew the dragon. I had a swamp at Viola, and his life relinquished in this affray. That was my sire, Lord Werner. Okay, these dwell behind these dwell behind the woods are cloistered monks from Ingleburg. You will not look upon them with disdain, because they're serfs, and sit not free like we upon our heritage. They love the land <coughs> with res a repute. Give me your hand. He's fortunate whose body is duty, bound to no one on this earth. But honesty doth thrive in every class. This is Lord Redding, our old magistrate. I know him well. He is my adversary. Whoever, who, who o'er a piece of land disputes with me. Lord Redding, we are enemies at court. Here we are one. Shakes his hand. Now that is bravely spoken. You hear? They're coming. Hear the horn of Yuri? To the right and left, one sees armed men climb down from the rocks with storm lanterns. Mm -hmm. You better run back out here sooner. Look! Is that not God's pious servant there? The worthy pastor climbing down, nor shuns he toils o'er the way and terrors of the night, a faithful shepherd caring for his people. The sacrist trails him, and Lord Walter Purst. But tell, I do not see among the number. So okay. must we call upon our native soil and our paternal land in secrecy creep forth to meet, like murderers do, and by the night which lets its sable cloak. 
but to the crime and to conspiracies that shun the sunlight, we must seize upon our godly right, the which is pure and clear, just as the splendid open womb of day. Mouth top. Mouth top. I think Lazarus is on mute. Ah, yeah. Hey, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Even at that, what dark, what dark sun night hath spun is free and joyous in the light of the sun. Just you know, Lazarus, you're very uh, weak. The uh, the microphone's not working very well. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we were able yeah. to hear you, but it was very faint. Just so you know, for the future. Okay. Uh, here, my microphone must be. Up. All right, I might as well just be uh, like this. Even at that, what dark, what darksome night hath spun is free and joyous in the light of the sun. Confederates, hear what God bids my heart. We're meeting here in a place of assembly and can be deemed to represent the people. So let us meet by ancient usages o'er the land as we were wont in tranquil times. Whatever is unlawful in this meeting, be pardoned by the need or the time. Yet God is everywhere where justice is dispensed and underneath his heaven do we stand. Tis well, let's meet in line with ancient custom. Though it is night, so shines our justice forth. Though not in number full, the heart is here of all people. Here the best attend. Now, could you hear me? Am I, is my voice coming in good? Yeah. Okay. Are not the ancient books as well at hand, yet they are written down with our hearts? Now then, so let the ring be formed at once. Set up the swords of power in the ground. Now, let the magistrate assume his place and let his bailiff stand at either side. There are three people here to which belongs the right, to give a head to the assembly. Schweitz may contest with Yuri for his honor. We and Waldners freely stand aside. We stand aside. We are, sub we are the suppliants who ask assistance for, uh, from their mighty friends. Let Yuri then assume the sword. Its flag takes precedence upon our march to Rome. The honor of the sword should fall to Schwitz, for we all pride ourselves upon its stock. Let me resolve this noble competition. Schweitz leads in council, Yuri in the field. <laughs> So take. Not I. To the eldest be the honor. <laughs> Ulrich, the Schmied, is most advanced in years. The man is brave, but not a free estate. No bondman can become a judge in Schweiz. Is not Lord Reading here, the magistrate? Why should we seek for one yet worthier? Let him be magistrate and chief of the day. Who doth agree here to? Lift up his hand. I cannot place my hand upon the books. So swear I by the eternal stars above that I will never deviate from justice. What the is it? The swords are placed upright before him. The ring is formed around him. Schweitz holds the center. Yuri places itself to the right and Unterwalden to the left. He stands leaning on his battle sword. What is it that hath brought together here three mountain people at this ghostly hour upon the barren shoreline of this lake? What should the content be of this new league, which we here found beneath the heaven stars? No new alliance do we found. It is an old alliance from our father's time that we renew. No well, confederates, though lake, though mountain range may us divide, and every people govern for itself. So are we yet of but one stock and blood, and but one homeland is it from which we come. So is it true, as it is said in song, that we've come from afar into this land? Oh, tell us now, whatever's known to you, that this new league be strengthened by the old. Here, what the aged herdsmen do relate, 
There was a mighty people in the land back to the north that suffered from harsh famine. In this distress, the assembly did resolve that every tenth man as the lot might fall should leave his fatherland. That did occur. And forth, lamenting, men and women went, a giant army toward the midday sun, with sword in hand they struck through German land unto the highlands of these mountain forests. And never did the host become fatigued until they came upon the savage vale, where now the water runs between the meads. No trace of human beings was here seen, but one lone shelter stood upon the shore. Here sat a man and waited for the ferry, yet violently the lake did rage and was not passable. So they beheld the land more closely and perceived the beauteous wealth of timber and discovered goodly springs and thought they were in their dear fatherland. Then they, at once determined to remain, erected the ancient town of Schweitz, and many bitter days they had to clear the forest with its widely spreading roots. Then, later, as the soil no more sufficed, the people's number, they proceeded hither to the Black Mountain, yes, to Viceland hence, where, hidden by eternal walls of ice, another people speak another tongue. The village stands they built beside the Kernwald, the village altar by the valley of the Royce. Yet stayed they, ever mindful of their source, from all the foreign races that since then have settled in the middle of their land. The men of Schweiz each other recognize. There is the heart, the blood by which they're known. Yes, we are of one heart and of one blood. We are one, one people. people. We act We're as one. <laughs> the other people bear a foreign yoke. They have submitted to the conqueror. Even within our country's bounds, there live some settlers who are bound by foreign duties and pass their servitude on to their children. Yet we, the genuine race of ancient Schweiz, we have forever kept our liberty. Never to princes have we bowed the knee. Freely we chose the Emperor's protection. We freely chose the Empire's shield and refuge, so doth it read in Emperor Friedrich's charter. For masterless, it is also not the freest. There has to be a chief, a highest judge, where one may turn for justice in dispute. Hence for the ground, which they have salvaged from the ancient wilderness, our fathers granted the honour to the Emperor, who is called the Lord of German and Italian soil and like the other free men of this realm, pledged him the noble service of their arms. For this alone is every free man's duty, to shield the empire which gives him protection. We lost you again, Lazarus. You hear me? You're going to have to shout it. Okay. What is beyond that have mark of serfdom? Whenever the court of arms went forth, they followed. The empire's banner and they fought its battles. To Italy they marched with arms in hand to place the Roman crown upon his head. At home they ruled themselves most cheerfully by ancient usages and their own law blood sentences alone were the emperor's right. And there too was assigned a noble count who had his domicile not in the land when blood guilt came to pass. They summoned him and neath the open heaven, plain and clear, spake he the law and with no fear of men where are the traces here that we are slaves? Is there one? Who knows otherwise? Speak out. No, everything stands thus. Just as you state, we've never tolerated despotism. Gee, Starpacker talks a lot, doesn't he? Yes. <laughs> Magdalena, please take it away, Starpacker. Even to the emperor we refused, we refused obedience when he once bent the law to favor Parsons. For us, the clerics from the Abbey of Einsiedel laid a claim upon the Alp, which we have graced on since our father's time. The abbot yielded up an ancient charter, which granted him the unowned wilderness. For our existence, they had been concealed. And then we spake, this charter is a fraud. No emperor can bestow that which is ours and does the realm deny our rights we can admit our mountains too without the realm in such a way our fathers speak 
should we endure the infamy of this New York and suffer from the foreign vassal what no emperor in his might would do to us? This soil we have created for ourselves by labor of our hands, the ancient wood, which else was but the savage home of bears, we have changed into a domicile for man. The brood of dragons have we extirpated, which poison swollen climbed out of the swamps. The mystic cover have we torn away, which always gray hung, gray hung over this wilderness. The solid rocks blown up over the abyss. The wanderer conducted on safe paths by the procession of a thousand years the soil is ours, and now the foreign vassal should dare to come and forge his chains on us and bring disgrace upon our very soil? Is there no help against such great distress? No, there is a limit to the tyrant's power. When the oppressed can find no justice, when the burden grows unbearable, he reaches with hopeful courage up onto the heavens and seasons hither his eternal rights, which hang above, inalienable and indestructible as stars themselves. The primal state of nature reappears, where man stands opposite his fellow man as last resort when not another means is of avail. The sword is given him. The highest of all goods we may defend from violence. Thus stand before our country. Thus stand before our wives and for our children. Thus stand before, stand before our, our wives and our, our children. children. Thank you. Oh, no, it continues. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, actually, I'm going to stop it there. Because that moment is actually the 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 peak of, yeah. of the the oath the, the, this pretty much is the 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 epitome of what the oath is getting at so uh now we're gonna open up the discussion again because it's a long scene it's such an important scene of course it's pretty much the the up until this point we've been basically garnering reasons as to why they're going to do this what they're going to do this for what what kind of action it's going to generate in the future but here we reach a, a kind of epoch for them like a defining moment in this play when now this is only act two right so there's a lot there's, there's you know we're not going to get to the end today but from here it starts to get interesting this is when the battle starts so like 33 men have met on a mountain in secrecy and have formed an alliance have formed a united alliance against tyranny in in any form actually so it's a really powerful thing and that that text there this one no there's a limit to the tyrant's power like they're stating right here that you know as powerful as empire is it has its limit they're, they're just as human as anybody else right like and they're kind of uh you know, conducting the, the, you know, legitimizing the action they're about to take because they, this is scary what they're about to do and, and they're, they're kind of muddling through the, the reasoning as to how they're going to go about it. So they've got to that moment here and they say, no, there's a limit to the tyrant's power. When the oppressed can find no justice, when the burden grows unbearable, he reaches with hopeful courage up unto the heavens and seizes here for his eternal rights. So right here in, in this paragraph, we have the um, a reenactment of the Declaration of Independence of sorts, not to the level of what happened in the United States. Of course, anybody who's read that text, it, it's much more detailed. But the, the universality of that action is one of the same. And so we're brought brought back to these republican ideals and also in that discussion there i don't know if you, any of you noticed but there's kind of like some there's some conflicts actually between these guys they're, they're not a united nation yet so did they have like uh, there's a land ownership uh issue going on mm -hmm. they're organizing who's gonna basically 
uh, sort out these issues. They're organizing who's going to be fighting. They're organizing who's going to make decisions. They're organizing, they're electing officials. So this democracy like, um, is already very much in play. And uh, we could see, like anybody who's looked at um, you know, details or kind of memoirs of Europeans who were the first to go to America, the same thing happened, right? You have these speeches that happened on ships where these people start organizing themselves politically and start electing officials that they trust in, basically like uh, smaller versions of philosopher kings, like people who are natural born leaders and they might not necessarily be the one, but a, a group of many individuals who are using their God-given inalienable right to reach out their hands and say, we're going here, this is the future, this is our vision, this is what we want. We are just in wanting this, it's not just because we're children and complaining, we are just in wanting this, this is universal, it's not just for us, it's for the people that will live after us. So whether it's, you know, Switzerland's already an old nation and they say like, it's, it's from our ancient times that we're kind of rebirthing this ideal into a new paradigm and a new Switzerland. So now I'm going to just quickly, because yet yeah, we're really uh, running over time here. I misjudged the, the uh, length of this. I'm going to take you through some of these slides. Do you see? Nope. Okay. So in this slide, we have uh, a very beautiful painting. This moment happens later in the play. This is the moment, this is called the Tellersprünge. It means the jump of Tell. And it's a moment in the play where he has been arrested because I'm sure you all know well, there's a part in the play where he refuses to bow to the hat of the governor. And upon refusing, he's arrested and threatened to be killed. But then the governor says, oh no, I'm not gonna kill you. I'm a tyrant, I'm gonna have some fun and, and kind of, you know, check how whatever, like he knows, he hears his name and he's like, I've heard you're a really good archer. So I wanna see how good you are. He's acting all arrogant. Anyway, Tell pulls out his bow and the governor says, you have to shoot the apple off your head. At first, Tell obviously refuses, that's an awful, predicament to be put in the, the very fact that you're risking your son's life but then you know he uh, he has a plan so he takes a second arrow and he has it at the ready and he shoots the apple off his son's head after being told that if he doesn't they'll be killed and then he holds up a second arrow and he turns to the governor and he said and just so that you know had I had I have missed and killed my son this one was for you so he like honestly tells him that he's a really just man. He has nothing to hide. He's completely honest. He honestly tells the governor, like you committed an injustice. I was ready to do that as, as kind of a fight back against you. <clears throat> so that goes and then they arrest him again. The governor of course arrests him and they take him on this boat. Then they're on this boat and a storm happens. A, you know, God given storm, a kind of ray of light. And in the storm, they crash into the rocks. And this moment is when Tell jumps from the rocks and it's become like a, a leap of faith. So wait, speak. wait, Nicholas. Yeah. Okay. They actually are in the storm and they're so desperate. They are asking Tell to lead the boat to the shore to save them, please. <laughs> so even the oppressor or well, they're, they're yeah, the, the people who have arrested him who are just as scared as anyone. Yes. Uh, see the God-given talents of this man and yeah, want him to lead them out of a chaotic situation even. This is a beautiful statue of Tell in Altorf that anybody can go visit. It stands right there in Switzerland, I've, I've been, so uh, yeah. This is the actual place on Lake Luzern where apparently uh, Tell made the jump. So this is called um tells platter i think it is am i right Michael? and it's like a gazebo in honor of his 
uh, yes. religious acts. They build a, a chapel there. Yeah. Again, it's the real thing. Anybody can go visit. You can see the scene. Um, yeah, Switzerland and Divine. This is a, a picture of the scene where he is forced by the governor. Uh, you can see the people around as well. They, they think it's all fun and games. Again, you know, just following their senses. They, some people were shocked, of course, but um, you see that most people are just gossiping about it. You know, they're not really aware of the historical context of these actions. Um, that's the general mass is, is often the case. You know, popular opinion leads people to a certain kind of lack of thought generally speaking. Now I want to talk like very quickly because we have run out of time and um, we've gone through a lot today on the Root Leof. I actually had a whole monologue on the Root Leof that I'm going to have to, because I want to move on to the economic side a bit. And just to quickly kind of wrap this up, these are some pictures of Switzerland. And I think it's pretty obvious to everyone the standards by which the Swiss people live. Um, now, like I said to um, Mr. Trudeau, who left earlier, there are many issues with Switzerland's history, right? And that, that's, you know, obviously a given and, you know, no nation doesn't have a certain uncomfortable past. But I just want to bring a point, you know, uh, the thing about like any in his in switzerland's history like for any mistake that they made you often see a rejection like a, a, a clear learning of that mistake so take what happened with the nazi regime in 1994 switzerland actually made an official apology to the jewish people for the role and the the role of accessorizing the nazi regime uh, very few nations still to this day have apologized for their role in the Second World War. Japan, for example, has still not apologized or come out and expressly uh, said to the, North, uh, the South Koreans or the Chinese. And it's a point in contention still to this day, believe it or not, in diplomacy. It's still, and the Kuril Islands in Russia. Japan still to this day has not signed a peace treaty with Russia after the Second World War. People might think that that's like not an important point. I can assure you, like it's a very important point because these things are cultural schisms, and uh, people are proud of their nation, and they should be. But it's we are provided with a conflict when we have a, a darkness in our past or a mistake, and pride sometimes will stop a culture from. There's an irony, right? Like you're supposed to be proud of your nation and patriotic, but at the same time we've all committed acts that we're not proud of. So how do we go about reunifying or like learning from those mistakes in a way which doesn't ascertain blame, but actually brings about a, a higher level of understanding between nations and a kind of uh, co-unity, right? So this is something that we're still figuring out. And I think that China's Belt and Road Initiative can go a long way to fixing a lot of these issues by nations uh, like you see with these men, right? They have uh, individual issues with one another, but they rise above those issues to form a unity for the greater common cause of each and every one of them and all the people of Switzerland. We can do that on a world level too. And I think Schiller, his entire life worked towards that end, that citizens should think on a universal scale, on a world level, and think of themselves as capable, like, you know, before I'm British, I'm part of the human species. And you have different levels of, you know, different layers of patriotism. So, like I was saying earlier, like, some of the beauties of what Assad was presenting to us last week in Islamic culture are prevalent in uh, Western cultures too. And so it would be silly for me as a Westerner to take too much pride in things that have not been done by us as well. And so that's where there is a unity of ideals because in other cultures, we see very much the same principles. And, and I think the West right now is really struggling with kind of a superiority complex or 
you know, just because our actual physical standard of living is maybe higher than the rest of the world doesn't mean we don't share the very same cultural ideals. And there are many, many reasons as to why other parts of the world have not been able to develop. One of them is colonialism. So the West, to, to heal the past mistake of colonialism, we should be forming a, a kind of Western Belt and Road Initiative that can work in tandem alongside China's to restore the cultural image of the West worldwide because the Western image is severely damaged. Like I can say that having been around the world and spoken to people, our image in a Sri Lankan or a Kenyan or a Tanzanian mind is not the best one. It is certainly not a good one. It's one of oppression. And so the only way that we're going to be able to rectify this problem, this cultural issue, is by thinking on the, on the level that Schiller is asking us to in this play and think of ourselves as world citizens as responsible for our culture. And we must be the uh, political legislators, as Percy Shelley so accurately said 200 years ago, and use culture and art to elevate people to that place where they actually believe that these things are possible. Because nations have gone on to achieve it, like I say in these pictures, look at Switzerland. Now I'm going to go on to show you a little bit of, um, sorry. Like this is Switzerland's transport network, right? You have this tiny country with only a few million people and their standard of living. If you take uh, Lyndon LaRouche's principles on economics, population flux density, energy flux density, Switzerland really does embody in the world today. Now, there's a higher ideal than even Switzerland, of course. But in the world today, for me, in my studies through infrastructure and, and you know, uh, development generally, Switzerland, if you take it as a piece of land, it's probably the, mo the, the most developed piece of land on the planet, bar Japan, maybe. But Japan has 280 million people. Switzerland only has, I think, uh, you know, 20 or so. It's a very, 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 very small country. In terms nine, of nine million. Nine, half of that. So, and look at that transport network. And by the way, that's all state owned, you know? And in these pictures to the side here, you see like the, they're, they're world beaters. Here is another project, the Gotthard Tunnel. It was just finished in 2017. Okay, like this is the, the literal mountain they had to go through. All right, it's seven, in total, it's 51 kilometers long, this tunnel. It took over, it was begun in, uh, let me move to the next slide, in 1999, so 17 years of building. How many years of planning do you think went into this? So Switzerland really is a nation that embodies like I think in the world today, that ability to think of the future needs of a nation, and they really go for, for those uh, ideals. And they're building things that America would be proud of. But this tiny nation is really a world beater. They, they exhibit some of the, the most developed industries of any nation in the world. This, this tunnel was built like with domestic technology. And that's another place where independence lies, right? In your economic uh, foundations and uh, their, their ability to build these huge infrastructure projects you know they, they're not like um, printing ridiculous amounts of money and stuff like this of course there are issues with the banking system they're, they're just as much a part of it as anybody else but on a governmental and political and cultural level you still have that independent factor where they are pushing their country to to higher and higher heights 2019 just last year Switzerland's rail network got number one in every single department of the year. Service, usability, price ratio to distance covered, time travel to distance covered, they top every single charter. 
I've been on Swiss trains, they're faultless, faultless. The standard of infrastructure is, is one that is unparalleled in the world if you take the country as a whole. So the main purpose of this Gotthard tunnel is to increase the local transport capacity. See, this isn't just for Switzerland, okay? This transport corridor changes the whole uh, strategic factor for the entire European continent. Now, the distance between Rotterdam and um, the port in Piraeus in Greece, for example, is about four or five hours shorter in total. When we talk, you know, uh, customs, borders, clearing customs, all of these things, by building tunnels like this, 57 kilometers long, you've got to understand how much further they have to go around that mountain and how much more time that takes. The Alps, there are not many breaks in it. There's only one way through, over or underneath, or the long way, which is like, uh, you know, very twisty turning. And there are those trains too. They have scenic trains, but they did this not just for themselves. This was for Europe, the European plan. It's part of the European Magistrale, which is our transport plan under the European Union. Another case in point out of that entire plan, which is uh, seven transport corridors running through Europe, it's only this one so far and a couple of others that have actually been achieved largely in thanks to Switzerland. Left to the European Union, not much is getting done. So it does show, like it does strike a very, uh, you know, two polars in, in the way that they think about how to develop their country. This is again another picture of, of the glorious level of development that they are doing. They're building these things again in the middle of mountain ranges. This is really difficult stuff. We can almost go as far as to say that the Gotthard Tunnel is a miracle of the human species. We rose above the multiple challenges they had to develop, new domestic technology to do it. China is doing it all the time. And this is where I see a lot of similarities between Switzerland and China. Also, Switzerland in 2016 was one of the first countries in Europe to join, join on to the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, independence lies there politically too. They do not koto to the European Union dictatorship that is currently crumbling. We should have Brexit by next week. Um, more, that's the end of the Gotthard Tunnel coming out on the Italian side. Another brilliant, you know, example, and this is an international uh, project, the Large Hadron Collider. I'm sure you've all heard of it, Chern. But maybe not many of you have heard that there's a future plan to build an even bigger one. So instead of what you see here in the bottom left corner, this is the Large Hadron Collider with multiple other projects that they built either before or after. I think this one here, the PS, was done in actually 1974 or something. The Large Hadron Collider was only done a short time ago. Already there are plans to build a much, much, much larger version of that that will be able to conduct much more impressive and, um, yeah, like experiments and research and uh, on matter, on physics, on what is antimatter and all sorts of things. In 2000 and, uh, was it 2012, I think? Yeah, the Large Hadron Collider was finished being built in September 2008. Well, that's only 12 years ago, and they're already drawing up plans to build a bigger one. It's quite impressive, you know? It's a particle accelerator that pushes protons, ions to near the speed of light. Again, we're talking miracles here. They are understood, but a lot of what they're doing is uh, you know, searching in the dark. It consists of a 27 kilometer ring of superconducting magnets with a number of accelerating structures that boost the energy of the particles along the way. I'm just spelling out a couple of achievements of this Large Hadron Collider. Uh, inside the LHC, the two particle beams travel at close to the speed of light before they are made to collide. They are guided around the accelerator ring by a strong magnetic field maintained by superconducting electromagnets. The electromagnets in the LHC are therefore chilled to minus 271 degrees, a temperature colder than outer space, to take advantage of this effect. Again, I mean, we're talking about things that nobody else on the planet is really doing. So I know they're not, you know, they're, they're not the finished deal, 
but they, they do exhibit these things in practice. They are active in these principles. Responsible for the discovery of the Higgs boson particle in July 2012. And just to give an idea of the sheer amount of uh, infrastructure, physical infrastructure has over 9,500 magnets. We can only imagine how many jobs that created. Hence why you don't really see so much of an employment problem in Switzerland. Again, we could go into that more because there are this, some, there's some conflicts in there and some contradictions. But yeah, by and large, um, you're looking at a country that really does push on all levels, whether it's science, technology, bioengineering, Syngenta, some of the biggest companies in the world that are involved in chemistry and stuff come from Switzerland. They're, they're, yeah. There's tax reasons for that too, of course, but you know. It's at the end. That's the end. Brilliant. So there you have it. And um, like I say, like Switzerland is not the finished product. And I, I don't want people to leave here like thinking that I think Switzerland's like everything that we should, we should reach for. Because there, <laughs> like I say, there's like loads of problems. But if you talk about a people that's willing like to go out and, and you know, God, they, they just have so much going on for them. And Okay, they have an absolutely xenophobic uh, immigration policy. And, you know, yeah. <laughs> Lynn would be like, no, we're like, that's awful. And of course, that's, that's obvious. And it would be a benefit for Switzerland if they, if they relaxed that immigration policy and took their economic principles and used that influx of population to generate even more productivity. But they, it's the xenophobia thing. They they want it for the Swiss people and only the Swiss people, and it becomes a bit like elitist like that. So that's the discrepancy there. But the principles largely of the same in economics, at least, still developing uh, things for the future, and they're still using the entire populace to make that happen. It's organized, it's unified, and for me, at least, it represents a country acting as a global nation because now they are getting involved in the Belt and Road Initiative and with all the technology and knowledge that they have, um, I can only expect good things to come from them. For example, they are working right now on a feasibility study uh, to build the Bioceanic railway line across South America from a port in Brazil, Bahia, to a port in Peru. It's in its feasibility study phases, but Switzerland's very much a part of it because, of course, their understanding of rail building and uh, tunnel building is literally second to none. And so, therefore, they want to partner with China and Chinese credit uh, in getting these things done. They're also the epitome of pragmatism, but still brings about good things. So, thank you guys for listening. I'm sorry it was so long. Um, yeah. Thank you, Nick. I, I learned a lot. I, this is uh, this is much more than I expected. Thank you so much. Thanks, Nick. It was a wonderful class. Uh, yeah, a lot of things to learn there. Thank you guys for bearing with me. Uh, yeah. No, and I, I admit I, I also had a very sort of uh, one-dimensional uh, naive idea of Switzerland. You know, of the uh, the place with you know renegade Nazis uh, laundering money and. <laughs> I mean, you know, they, they produce some wonderful treasures like Madeline, but uh, but these Absolutely. were novels in my mind. I didn't realize what was active there now um, in such a real real way. That was uh, and connecting that to this beautiful tradition going back 800 years or more is, yeah, really. really yeah, cool. it, for me, it looks like they've still got it. Of course, like there there is a conf like like I say that it's not all one way traffic, but. From what I see, the way in action, maybe not in word, but in action, they're doing it. Huh. Like I say, they were, they, I think they were actually the first European country to join on and sign a memorandum of, of understanding with China's Belt and Road Initiative. And I know that they received a lot of political pressure not to do that because they, they set off a wave for other European countries to, to jump on board, right? Once Switzerland had done it, Italy was like, well, why not? And Spain was like, oh, fuck it. Why not? Let's go for it. And then before you knew it, Hungary, uh, 
Slovakia, and uh, I think Poland as well. Already, already around half of Europe actually. There's about only about 27 countries that are still holding out. There's about 50 countries on the European continent. Most of them have already bought into this Belt and Road Initiative. So, Doug, uh, did you have a uh, a comment you wanted to uh, throw out there? I can't oh, see no, your no. message. <clears throat> I, I, I don't think uh, I wouldn't want to. Uh, Nick has done a superb job um, talking here, and, and uh, I see nothing to add on. Um, I like the Jonah uh, comparison and parallel in the William Tell story, but other than that, we're doing fine. Yeah. Yeah, it's not all doom and gloom, man. Eh? And that, that's the thing. Uh, I, 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 yeah. I mean, we feel the decay of our culture, and and maybe. That's why we've got a fight. I, you know, I think that, that that makes it apparent, and we're in the fight. We're in it. Like, it's great, actually. It's really great. At least we're in it. Mm -hmm. like, you know, already four years ago, it could have been like war with North Korea, you know, and oh god, like p potentially already nuclear war with China. So, well, not so much that, but we're we're sort of in a gang war between one side that's tried to control the world for for almost forever. And the other side, which uh, is the sort of idea that the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the Mathers and Winthrop's and various others brought to the U.S. and which is embodied in Schiller as well. Yep. Absolutely. Nick, I have a question. Uh, who do you think uh, uh, is, uh, would be best represent uh, the Goliath uh, inside Switzerland uh, against the Swiss people? Inside Switzerland today? Yes. Yeah, I would say the banking system. In Geneva. Yes, it's where it's centered. Hence why like a lot of United Nations things are there too and it, it is intertwined to a certain degree, so, so yeah. But it uh, looks like uh, that the same banking system isn't very tyrannical towards the Swiss people because the Swiss people seem to be reaping some benefits from it. So they're less likely to rebel against it. They're, they're, there's, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a likelihood that a, a William Tell would emerge from within the Swiss people now. Well, yes, I mean, they, maybe they've learned their lesson. Mm -hmm. And then they, they, they know that they have a duty to, to keep their people happy at least so that they can have the stability that they've exhibited over the past decades. Switzerland's always been a, a country of stability and security and it's a solid place in Europe, you could say. Uh, that's probably down to their economic policies and the fact that they are raising the standard of living continuously and therefore they keep their people happy. But there's a little bit of a thing in that because of course, if you did sort out the banking system, they're actually capable of more. Around the world, I mean. So Switzerland, if you take its knowledge and its technology and they were to actually have a national bank that would start uh, directing and developing credit towards those ends, developing third world nations, helping for you know, transfer of technology, bringing African students over to universities in Switzerland or Asian students over to universities in Switzerland and educate, you know, offering them grants. China does this, by the way. 30,000 grants every year go to African students from China. Mm -hmm. Switzerland could do this. They have a surplus in their universities. They're not packed to the rafters. They have space. They could really be a world, not just a world beater, a world leader in the sense that they could stand up and say, you know, we're only 9 million people, but we have the know-how, we have the technology, and we're going to take it on a universal level. And we're really going to be idealistic about this and say, how far can we go? How quick can we get that bioceanic railway up and running? How quick can we blast through the Andes mountain range and link the South American people? We did it with the Gotthard Tunnel in, in uh, you know, 12, 13 years. Can we do it even faster this time? So... They, they really do have the, the, the mandate to go ahead and, and do those things. I think, I hope they will. I, I think they will. I, I think it's the natural and obvious choice.
but it is going to take a little bit of political pushing still. And like I say, that banking system needs to be uh, nationalized. Could you uh, end your screen share? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, Uh, Nick, could I just say something on Geneva? Please. Just so people get an understanding of Switzerland, why some part is good and other part you go is so rotten. Kind of like Canada. But the uh, Geneva, you know, people see it today as part of Switzerland. Originally, Geneva was not part of the Swiss Confederation. Geneva never joined. They never, you know, swore the root league. In 1815, in the Congress of Vienna, you know, after the Napoleonic Wars and the oligarchs were dividing up Europe, Geneva was made a part of Switzerland. They forced the Swiss to accept them. So I used to discuss this with Tony Chaikin, and he agreed with me. And then he did about a million times more research than I did. And it, if you get his new book, he goes into it about the British deployment into the French Revolution. And other history books will talk about these Swiss agents. But Tony correctly says they're all from Geneva. And he lists them. He, it's like two pages of these guys. Like uh, Jacques Necker was not a Swiss banker. He was a Genevan banker. And John Paul Marat was from Geneva. Even in the United States, uh, Albert Gallup, he was from Geneva. All of Aaron Burr's connection into the Swiss intelligence wasn't Swiss intelligence. They were all from Geneva. Mm. And uh, Geneva was like a city-state, very similar to Venice, like an oligarchical cesspool, real evil place. And the oligarchs... tried out a lot of their crazy projects there first. And the British had an alliance with Geneva and the whole British operation to try to subvert the French Revolution to turn it into chaos. They deployed all of these agents out of Geneva. So on the one hand, in Switzerland, you have these great projects you were talking about. On the other hand, you still have this oligarchic cesspool that they haven't quite flushed down the toilet yet. <laughs> so I just want to say that. And if people really want to know, you got to get Tony's new book. That's the greatest history book that's ever been written, I swear. I bought it for Christmas. Yes, there you go. Yeah. I thought support Tony and his great work. And yeah. Oh, one other thing, Matt Magdalena says I got to tell you about is Rossini. So Rossini wrote an opera. Usually Rossini wrote these little, you know, Italian comedies, you know, he's famous for. His last opera, when he went to Paris, he wrote an opera based on William Tell. Most people know the famous William Tell Overture, which is fantastic, but the opera itself is very long. It's it's, it's written originally in French. It's very hard to get. And Rossini took a lot of these old Swiss folk songs and he used the melody as the themes in, in the opera. So it's, it's, people might, if you like opera, it's, I like it. Yeah, it is, it's beautiful. Like, yeah. check it out. Another one to check out like uh, as an inclusion to that because Rossini's is brilliant and of course uh, Rossini's is a direct capture of William Tell the story and everything but I have this has come through someone else but uh, a suggestion of Beethoven's Egmont Overture it was written in 1809 during the Napoleonic occupation of Vienna Egmont was a play written by Goethe about another subject dear to Schiller's heart the revolt of the Dutch people against Spanish tyranny and occupation. The Spanish were also of the Habsburg dynasty. Uh, Though the Uvacho follows the action of the play closely, it does capture the sense of an emerging new age of freedom prevalent at the time. So it's another uh, 
you know, artful capture of that feeling. Mm. And another one that sort of reflects a little bit of that sentiment um, is uh, Don Giovanni by Mozart as well, which doesn't have the the Promethean uh, hero that that it doesn't have a Wilhelm Wilhelm Tell figure in it. It sort of has the absence of a Wilhelm Tell figure, which is sort of its own presence throughout the whole thing. You, you have these little peasants who uh, are being used by this uh, entitled oligarch who just feels like he can sleep with whomever he wants, even if they're about to be betrothed. Um, and then you have a supernatural sort of hand of God <laughs> uh, force impose itself as natural law mm -hmm. onto the character too which should, in the minds of, of anybody watching, really uh, get across these two, two ideas of law, the arbitrary law of the oligarch versus the law of God, and which mm -hmm. is more powerful. Yeah, it's uh, an age-old story. Mm. But, uh, I mean, I really feel like we're moving closer towards the light, and... Uh, I, I would hope that other people are too. I mean, these things are never black and white, you know, it's, it's like, uh, we are writing history as we speak, live and breathe. So uh, we have just as much a right to be a part of it as any of these Donald Trumps or, uh, you know. And if people feel that they can do it better, well then, why not? And give it a shot. And uh, our trials and tribulations will tell us whether we can or not. Early days, you know, like uh, don't run before you can walk, but yeah. Very well said, Nick. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I'm like thinking now, I'm like, God, what did I miss? And I'm like, oh, probably everything, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> all right so, go back and be like what no how did i miss that <laughs> no it's great that this is on the public record i've never i've not experienced a class like this so this is great that we we have this now um for public consumption and i'm sure it's going to give us a lot of uh, a lot of continued discoveries to make going forward yeah so next week we're gonna uh most likely if all things go well have another uh class to sort of round out this class cycle on the poetic principle. Um, we're probably going to look at a little bit of painting and uh, some drama. The week following that, Anton Shakin uh, was gracious enough to deliver a lecture to us, uh, going through the content and uh, theme of his volume one that was just released last week. And uh, probably give, he'll probably give us a little bit of a teaser of volume two as well. So be sure to invite friends, people who you, you have in your, in your contact network. Uh, that'll be a really great introduction for anybody who's uh, thinking about higher ideas right now. Great. Yeah, I'll tune in. Cool. All right, guys. So have a great week. Thank you again, Nick. Thank you, guys. Have a great evening. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, bye. Thanks.